but tell me if your experience is like mine. So especially as a bachelor, being married, it kind of gets, gets muddled in there a little bit, but especially as a bachelor, which I did for 35 years, here's my experience, is I would go to the store, and I would affirm as I went there, man, vegetables are worth my while. I got to eat plenty of these things to stay healthy. In fact, I had to eat lots of different kinds of vegetables, different colors, you know, the red ones and the green ones and the yellow ones, all different colors of vegetables. I need the fiber in my body, and I need whatever it is they do to my body to happen in my body. I need them, and I love them, and I appreciate them. But then I get to the store, and I look at all the varieties of things, and I still have the resolve. You know, I'm, I think I'm going I'm to buy some, but I don't know if that one's the one I want. It's the right color, but the wrong flavor, so... You pick out the ones that you'll take home. You pick out the varieties you're going to bring home. You want to go for the fresh ones maybe because you have this resolve. I'm going to be a good eater this week. You get them to your refrigerator, and then you go back to your refrigerator a few hours later to make some food, and you see the vegetables, and then you see the enchiladas that you had the day before, right? We'll do it tomorrow. Today, enchiladas. Tomorrow, vegetables. We'll go with that one, right? So you go back the next day, and you open your refrigerator again, and your cupboards. What am I going to have to eat? Man, oh, there's the vegetables. Man, I should have those. Those are really good for me. Ah, but then, you know, quesadilla, that's my weakness. Those are always good. Quesadilla cheese with a little bit of meat in that and just a little salsa. Man, I think I'm going to go that way today because they're good. I just don't really, uh, right now, I'd rather have the other thing. And then the week goes by, and pretty soon the vegetables start to go a little bad. I start to see a little mold, a little bit of, you know, they start to go, and I'm like, well, kind of from away now, you know, I better, have, I better have this time maybe that leftover pasta that I had the other day. Or a better, yeah, I'll go to the, the freezer and pull out the ice cream because I've done pretty good about not eating too many fats this week, and so I'll have my, my bowl of ice cream, right? And then you eventually kind of throw away all the vegetables, and, the, and then you go through the round again, go to the store, I love vegetables, you get a lot of vegetables, I'll buy some vegetables, and you bring them home, and then more, half of them go bad every week because you never really get around to actually eating the vegetables. Now, fortunate for my wife and I, the past few, um, well, we'll say the past year or so, uh, some friends of ours have, have kind of unbeknownst to us, they, they, they signed us up with nutritionists, and they said, here you go. Uh, we're like, okay, we're kind of in a rut, you know. We've been married for now five years, as of Friday, by the way. Uh, and so you kind of get in a rut of life, right? And I've been, I'm, almost, I'm 40 years old, so I'm in a big rut of life, and I know how I go about my operation of vegetables and eating and so forth. And so I'm like, well, we'll see what happens. We'll talk to the guy, you know. We kind of know our pattern. And this guy was really great. He was, he was, I was surprised because just seeing his passion, he's a purist, total purist. I mean, this guy who doesn't touch anything that's been touched by human beings. It's like, he's a purist through and through. And, and his passion and his knowledge and explanation of the value of vegetables and the value of just eating right is kind of rubbed off. And so my wife and I actually have made some steps to having more vegetables in our diet and eating better and cooking better. And, you know, because it was helpful to have that person there. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I feel like our experience with evangelism it's a lot like our experience with vegetables, isn't it? I mean, we affirm it, and we're on board with the mission of God to reach people in the world. We, we affirm it, we read in the scripture, man, that is good. We know that our salvation was a product of God being on mission, right? And so we go out, we buy books, we get together, we do the rah-rah, we're all excited, we leave here, but you know what? Then Monday comes, and you know, gosh, right now I just don't feel like reaching out intentionally to someone. I really would rather just stay home. And I'm at the workplace, and, you know, that person who I know needs Jesus is there, and they're, they, they, it'd be a great time to bring up, but man, what if, I don't know, maybe not the right time, we'll put it off, and then the week goes on, and I mean, we affirm it, right, but then we just never kind of get around to it, and it sort of spoils over time. We get back in our rut of our eating. We get rut of our living, and there's no intake of vegetables for our diet, but there's no outtake of evangelism. I think that that's common for us all, which is why I think the Lord put almost front and center in the New Testament one author who uh, seemed to embody just this passion, kind of like our nutritionist for evangelism. I mean, Paul, the apostle, wrote most of the New, well, a large portion of the New Testament. In fact, he's the predominant author. He's the majority author of the books. And so when we get into that section, we can't help but get into Paul. We can't help but read Paul's prayers and, and Paul's passion for people. In fact, Paul even himself says, because I embody the heart of God, hey, do what I do 
Follow me as I follow Christ. The things you have learned from me and seen me do, practice in the presence of other people. And Paul, no doubt, is including in that both his life of love, but also his passion in evangelism. How he takes great lengths to go off and make sure people understand this. The scriptures understand who Christ is, that they would fall in love with him because they need to know him. I think that's why God puts that in the front and a focal point of his scriptures because he knows that for you and I, we're gonna need a good personal trainer in this whole area. Be reminded because God's heart is a heart of mission. It just is. That's why you're here, because he went after you. And that extension of going after is, I've made people who are not my people, I've called them my people, I went after them. And it costs a great deal for that pursuit because it costs Christ going from the glories of heaven to taking on the flesh, living on this earth, and going to the most brutal form of death on the cross in order for that relational gap to be bridged and forgiveness to be had and experience reconciliation. I mean, that's a great extent and a great passion that God had for your and my salvation. And God, I think, helps us with a little personal trainer, Paul, and a lot of the scriptures and what he writes, and he wants us to embody and resonate similar to how the apostle Paul is. Now, before we do this, we gotta understand that the purpose of, I think, God doing that, even of me in this morning's kind of sharing with you, is not to guilt you, to beat you over the head, hey, shame on you. I've been to so many sermons in which which there's, I feel, conviction, but also a bit of shame, because let's face it, uh, if you're like me, then you fall short of kind of what that standard of intake is, right? Nobody, it, or very few of us are getting it right. And those few that are, man, it's at times we can, we can hear from them share about what they do, and, and in some ways they say, you gotta be doing the same things. You go, oh my goodness, I just, that's a heavy load to bear, your personality type, right? This is not to guilt anybody. It's to goad you, to spur you on. It's to kind of challenge and help you take the next. I think that's why God did, not to recreate you into being someone you're not, but to help put focal in the center of our world saying, no matter how God's made me to be, I want this thing to be resounding, that God, you seek after sinners, and I want to seek after them too. Full measure of personality, full measure of type of, of creation he's made you to be, unique in his expression, but even still, a clear focus and passion. That's the goal. So I'm hoping this morning will be, it'll kind of be a little spur, a little goad for you to think differently this week, to go about your life at your workplace, life at your neighborhood a little bit differently this week. So we're starting a series right now, Found People, Find People. You see our little board up there, and you see it in your notes, Found People, Find People. We're starting a series, really is a continuation of really lots of series that we did when I first got here in the book of Romans. And if you're not already there, you can turn to Romans chapter 10. But what we're going to do this morning is, is allow Paul to, who is sort of that personal trainer guy, just to focus on one verse, a single verse, 16 words in your ESV text, in which Paul is going to kind of pull open his chest, I mean in a figurative way, and show you his heart. And allow ourselves, sort of like myself and that personal trainer, just sit and listen and think about and let the passion of Paul, the one whom God put before us as uh, an inspired writer of scripture to, to hopefully ooze upon our lives and we'll get a better, clear understanding. Because what Paul has done to this point, now we'll, we'll kind of go back to really one series to chapter nine, because nine through 11 is really one section of scripture in which Paul is wrestling with why more Israelites aren't saved. And in chapter nine, Paul has, has sort of said this straight, straightforward, that they're not being saved because God made a unilateral free decision. Well, if he made all that decision, then what does it matter for the urgency of me to get out there and share? Chapter 9, 30 to 33, kind of flips the coin, turns the page, which says God's decision-making about the world is playing itself out in the world. And now in chapter 10, verse 1, he's going to use his servant to reinforce the urgency. It is, even though it's attached to, to the, the sovereignty of God, reinforce the urgency of your or my activity. And so Paul, after kind of turning that page, saying this is what we're seeing God do in the world and how it's playing itself out, he says, let me tell you my heart and my passion for this world. Now from these simple 16 words, what I want to do is use them to to, uh, kind of give three heart check questions for us. Just three heart check questions. Again, not meant to guilt, but to goad. For you to get to ask yourself and evaluate kind of where your heart lands on on these topics. Okay, chapter one, I'm sorry, chapter 10, verse one. 
Paul says this. I'm not even there. That is a big faux pas. All right, brothers. Almost like Paul is now, after explaining what's going on and in more of an academic sense and, and sort of a bit removed, he kind of pulls his chair close. Brothers, kinsmen, friends. Now the context here, we got to understand, is the context of Israel. That's the immediate context. Why aren't they being saved? And his passion is that they are saved, but the application of what he's going to be saying here applies very broadly and generally into all walks of life, to all people. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be free from Roman oppression. Mine actually doesn't say that. I'm hoping yours doesn't either. There may be experience, economic, prosperity. So I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just kind of guessing that yours not saying that either. To, raise your hand if it says this, be healed of disease. Oh, my prayer for those people that I love is that they have no disease that they're healed from, from all of the, the whooping cough and the pink eye and all the, you know, even the flu and, and all the things that is keeping them ailed, the you know, leprosy and, 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 you know, uh, what do you call it, uh, handicappedness and blindness and all those things. I want them to be totally healed of that. That'd be awesome. My people, the kinsmen, God's people, the Jews. No, that's not his prayer. I want to experience world peace. I want them to, to finally find the, the cure for all the problems in the world and go make world peace happen. And, and in a part of that, let's just clear out the ozone also. Right? Let's make the world uh, uh, green and perfect again. That's my prayer. See, that's not what he says. Now, we, we sort of wish he had said that because we get caught up in a lot of different tracks of life in which become the focal thrust of our experience. But Paul says the passion of my heart, the desire that I have, my prayer, is that they may be saved. And that concept, the, the, the desire of my heart, is a very unique construct in the Greek. It's, it's not used this way in any other place, but there's this, this little word attached to the very beginning. It's, it's the may, but it's, it's, uh, it's forget what I said that, but basically what it is, is Paul saying, as far as it depends upon my will, I know that God makes choices, but as far as it depends upon my will, I'm going to go to that distance to see that they're saved. As far as it depends upon me, I'm going to go all that way to see that they're saved. And I'm going to pray to that end to see that they're saved. Because he understands this one thing, that the heart of God beats for the salvation of people. When you look in the scriptures, look in, the, in, in Jesus' words, he tells about parables. You'll hear this in your life groups this week, but, but here's a little tester. The one thing God celebrates over in all of the conversation Jesus has is not the many who stay together. It's the one who's found. It's the son who returns. It's the coin that's found. It's the sheep that is, that is away from the fold that the shepherd goes after and brings back and rescues and there's a greater party in heaven over the salvation of one individual than the, than the staying together of the 99. God is passionate about people coming to know him. The idea of being saved is focus on Christ. That they would trust Jesus, abandon their thought that they can measure up to God's standard or be, be in some way acceptable to him on their own and say, Jesus, you did all that for me. I trust you for my righteousness. I trust you as the means of my washing of my sins away and there's reconciliation with God only because you died for me. That's the heart and passion of God. Paul gets it. That's why Jesus said, kind of emulating that, that heart, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Right away, I mean, it's right out of the gates, guys. Hey, follow me and it's gonna be a good road. You're gonna see lots of miracles. You're gonna have a great community. You're gonna get a, a great meal at the end of it all, right? Call the communion. But uh, no, it's follow me and I'm gonna make you fishers of men. Built in to the initial salvific, we might say, call is, a, is this mission that he puts him on. Oh, and by the way, at the end of his life, after he's resurrected, he, and he's about to ascend into heaven, he reaffirms that whole purpose for their being in his followership. He says, all power and all authority have been given to me, therefore, go. Make disciples. Baptizing them. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I commanded you. And this doesn't stop. Gosh, well, all right, Lord, I, I, 
I heard that, I went out, and I had one person come to Christ through, through me. Am I done yet? No. How many more should I get out there? More. See, the answer to God's kind of uh, question by somebody of, of how many people should I go after or do I want to see come, and the answer is just more, just more. Is it 200? No, more than that. Oh, is it 20,000? No, more than that. Is it a million? No, more than that. I just want more. We're not done. I'll tell you when I'm done when I return. I want more people. That's the heart of God. This more was shown, and you don't need to turn there, but in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, after Peter preached a powerful message on the day of Pentecost, there's 120 believers. Peter goes out and he preaches one day, and at the end of it all, it says about 3,000 souls were added to their number that day. That's incredible. Why would he put the 3,000? Just say lots of people. I think because God was counting. Numbers matter to God. More numbers matter to God. A few days later, man, this is, this is an epidemic. It is spreading like wildfire. Maybe it's a week later, maybe it's a week and a half, two weeks later, I don't know, but not much time later. The apostles are out doing stuff. Right? They're, they're just doing life. In chapter two, they says they're committing themselves to, to the apostles' teaching. They're meeting together, 3,000 people meeting together, and then breaking up into homes, and they're discussing, eating bread together, sharing things together, just doing life together. And they're coming back, and the Lord's adding to their number. And then it says, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Now, if I just doubled that, because let's just say there's about 50, 50 men and women, right? Then you have 10,000 people. If you had children, that's a lot of people. 10,000. It's a lot of people. By that time, man, you've got, I mean, you've got what it takes to have a great worship band. You've got a great kids program running. I mean, you're, you're just firing all cylinders there. You're, obviously, your outreach program is pretty amazing, Right? Your, your Kidsville area is just busted the seams because there's plenty of resource and plenty of people helping out, and there's, there's, it's the best in the area. In fact, now they have a voice. Now because they have 10,000 people, we'll say, in this area, maybe of uh, 50, 60,000, that's a substantial number. Now their voice matters in the public square. Now their voice matters with the government. They have influence. They can shift the course of things. Oh, God, so pleased and so happy about that. Guys, let's just make this happen here and change the politics. No, that's not what he does. What happens? Well, about a year later, I mean, they're still growing. God goes to phase two of the expansion program. Sends them into persecution. Scatters the church. Ah, we had such a good thing going there. Man, that program was running. Remember that thing? It was the best ever. Remember the good old days when our kids program had 2,000 kids in it? It was amazing. And God's like, yeah, you guys have gotten a little rut. I'm concerned you may not want to expand. My heart's to expand. We're going to bring some persecution on you. We're going to throw some wrenches into the things. And obviously nobody wanted this to happen. Who wants persecution? Who wants to be scattered? I don't think anybody, if they had heard God's agenda, would have said, oh, that's a wonderful plan, Jesus. Let's do that one. Right? Oh, no, no, no. Just pick somebody from our 10,000-member church, and we'll send them off. We'll let that person go somewhere. He's like, that's too few. See, you all got to be on the page of more. You all got to be on the page of more. So we're going to scatter you. See, God cares very deeply about more. Very deeply about expanding his program of salvation. That's his heart. That's what this idea of Paul praying for more to be saved, that they would be saved, and he puts his life into it. So here's the heart check question number one. Am I really on board God's expansion program? Am I really, capital R-E-A-L-L-Y, really on board God's expansion program? Does it matter to me? I mean, this church has to be about more people. It has to be. Not because we want to be the biggest, but because numbers matter to God. Because every number has a name. Every name has a story. And every story matters. And God has called us as the church to not get comfortable with all the bells and whistles, but to have on our focal point, we want to reach more. 
not more people to attend necessarily, but more people to know Jesus. And you know what that means? You're just going to grow. And that always creates problems, doesn't it? I mean, I mean, just bring a kid into your home and you've got plenty of problems. You're not sleeping already, you know, and you've got to spend money on this kid, diapers and whatever it is you've got to do. I mean, whenever you add people to an already existing community, it just adds problems, doesn't it? For one, they don't appreciate what the past was and all that's gone before them. They kind of come in fresh. For two, they, 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 if they're immature, then they're a little bit messy because how they relate to things, and those who are mature have to deal with it. I mean, it's just a messy situation. Yeah, so let's not get too many more. Now we got a problem. It has to be a more. Am I really on board God's program? See, and this isn't about just relocating the Christians in the Conejo Valley. We have the same 52 cards in our deck, and we shuffle them in between each hand, and we deal out new decks. Like the game of war, I want to get all the de- cards into my deck, right, and my side, and I'm going to take them from you. We don't want to just, the goal isn't to relocate and have the next hottest thing in town. People, oh yeah, we want to be at that, that church. Yeah, come. The next thing, and then 20 years later, no, go to that church. It's the next best thing. And moving around, that is not the goal. We're just relocating and reshuffling and redealing the Christian deck. This is about making disciples. If somebody's already at a church, let them stay there. If they're not happy, tell them to get happy. Tell them to do what they need to do to get happy. And go to the neighbor next door and tell them to come to your church because they need Jesus. We have to be on mission. And God cares whether or not we're on mission. So let's look at our mission field really quickly. Back in May, I did a little, uh, little survey of the demographics of 10 mile radius from the church. So take the church as the middle and you have 10 mile radius around. There's about 336,000 people 10 miles from the church. Of that, about 49, really 49% of those people have zero religious affiliation. That is an incredibly high number. In fact, the person who did this said, you guys are very unreached. 49% of the people in the Conejo Valley, or at least in the 10 mile region here in us, have no religious affiliation whatsoever. Now that's religion across the board, Muslim, Buddhist, Christian, even, even cults of Christianity, you name it, right? 49% are detached from any religious organization. Another 24%, or 80,500, are somewhat loosely attached to a religious institution. That leaves about 91,000, 27%, about a one-fourth, 91,000 people who are somewhat attached, or who are, I'm sorry, are committed to a religious institution somewhere. Now again, that covers the whole breadth of what religion is called in our country. So if we were to take a conservative number, and kind of a generous number, we'll say of 40% of those 91,000 are really committed Christians, followers of Jesus, we have 36,000 followers of Jesus in a 336,000 population. That's one in 10. That's generous. One in 10. Now, I know I'm not trying to scare you or go, oh my goodness, this is terrible. No, th- this, this, this means that nine in 10 people don't know Jesus, and that's a great mission field. That means if you're the, a Christian in your street or your apartment, you can assume that the four to one side and five to the other are not believers. Now, maybe there is one person. It means you can go farther for the next set. Don't know Jesus. I mean, that's, there's a lot of opportunity here. I mean, just take the opportunity, if we go half the people not even connected somewhere, to reach out to them. Now, we know where they're connected. They're connected to our baseball fields and our soccer fields, and right? This sports academy over here, man, they take care of all of the ins and outs for people and their ambition for their kids. That's where they're connected. But wherever you're at, that's our mission field. It's our neighborhoods. These people that all but 36,000 of them don't know the love of Jesus. They don't get it. So here's what we're up against, though, okay? And here's, here's kind of the problem that we, we face. The longer people are in church, the less they're willing to do for the gospel. 
It's kind of sad. Here's a, f- a stat. I just kind of drew it out. Things you're willing to do so people will love Jesus, time in church. This is what you would expect, right? The longer I'm in church, man, the more passion and the more things I'm willing to do and step out of and get going on so that they might know Jesus, no matter what it is. Here's what actually happens. You come to faith, man, I am passionate to know Jesus. I'm passionate to help people know Jesus. I am, I'm the best evangelist when I'm day one. And as time goes on, I find my way into a church and I get involved in different things and I know people on, you know what, this is, this is good, we feel really good. And it just gets less, I'm not willing to do that anymore. Man, at time, I'd, I'd go, with, I had a buddy who came to faith three months later. <laughs> he was in one of those uh, heat rooms at the gym, right? Not much clothing on evangelizes to the guy next to him. I think that's a social no-no, but not for him, right? New to the faith. This guy doesn't know Jesus. He should. I'm here. He's here. It's divine appointment, right? I don't know if I'm willing to do that. Maybe because I've been in the church too long. Now, I'm not saying shame on anybody here. I'm just pointing something out, to kind of a trend that happens. Because we become more willing to do Things of, hey, I'll, I'll do PowerPoint in the back, but I am not going to go to my next-door neighbor. Hey, I'll come here and I'll build, and this is awesome, build something for you guys, but you know what? That's kind of, I'm just not comfortable really talking to anybody. And I, I get personality types, but guys, we're all social somewhere. We all love on people somewhere, right? It's sad. It's interesting. I wrote here, the church can suffocate our passion for evangelism. I've seen it myself. I grew up in the church. And to be honest, I always dreaded, and I never really liked the messages about evangelism because I always thought like, well, that just gets me uncomfortable. I just don't like it very much. My evangelism will be to people who are already Christians. And I, there's a place for that. I mean, there is, and it's an important place. The discipleship process of people who, who, who call them up. But, but our call always is to care about people, whoever we meet, wherever we meet, to think about they need to know Jesus too. See, we have plenty of opportunities. It's just a matter of the choice of words we make and the, the, the intentionality we have in that moment to actually bring Christ into that conversation or into that environment. It's just about being intentional in that. We have the bandwidth. We have the space. But the church can suffocate our passion. And, wh- wh- and I thought, why is this? That the longer people are in church, the less they're willing to do for those who know Jesus. Francis Chan told the story about a conference he went to. And I thought this was very interesting. A conference he went to by a very well-known pastor. And this pastor got up and he shared about uh, how their church put on this incredible kind of Christmas program. Spent hundreds of thousands, of, I mean, they're a large church, hundreds of thousands of dollars. They had hundreds and hundreds of volunteers working for 10 to 15, even 20 hours a week for several months to get ready for that program. And lots of people came. I mean, non-Christians came, Christians came, and it was amazing got written about in the paper. It was wonderful. And Francis Chan just went up afterwards and said, hey, what? I mean, that's awesome, but wouldn't you have been more effective if you took that same number of people and said, use that 10 to 15 hours a week that you're using here to put on this program to get to know your neighbors, to pray with them, and to hopefully share the gospel and invite them to church? Wouldn't it be more effective? And the pastor says, well, sure, but they're not willing to do that. They'll come and they'll put on a program, but they, they won't get to know their neighbors. They won't put that on their calendar. Now, I'm not saying we're not willing to do that, but let's ask, how many neighbors have we gotten to know? I threw myself under the bus. Very few. So all I'm saying is a little heart check. Just a little heart check. Now, maybe, maybe it's because as we get involved in the church and we get settled in, we forget about the power of the Holy Spirit that he really is convicting people's lives. Well, he kind of stopped with me. I mean, he came to me, but, you know, I'm, it kind of stopped there. And I've been trying to witness so-and-so, and it hasn't happened, so maybe he doesn't want to do it ever, and so I'm now convinced that if he wants it to happen, it'll happen, I don't have to do anything for it. We kind of miss out on John chapter 16, the Spirit of God comes, and he convicts people of sin and righteousness and judgment and points them to the cross. Maybe it's because we start forgetting the power of the gospel. Romans chapter 1. The power of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel. And Paul took that to the nth degree. Because it's the power of God. Well, no, the power, Tim, is actually in, in my niceness to somebody. The power, Tim, is actually in the fact that, that I don't share too much about Jesus. That's the power. No. 
the power is in the gospel for salvation to all who believe. Now again, let's not pull from this the need for love and the need for method because a lot of people beat people over the head with, with nothing but harshness and meanness with the gospel and that's not where we're going here. But I putting myself as sort of the, the, the litmus test for everybody else, saying, I tend to hide behind my taking my trash out to the curb in a nice orderly fashion and saying, maybe they'll see that and they'll appreciate what Jesus has done for them. Maybe they'll want to be around me because I, I'm quiet with my lawnmower and I don't mow the lawn at seven in the morning. Maybe they'll just say, that neighbor's a good neighbor and so whatever he has, I want. No. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, that's some of the things I tend to do, and I really evaluate what's going on in my world. Man, that's, that's kind of what I'm, I'm living by. Maybe we just don't believe the Bible, the Bible says about the power of the gospel. And maybe, here's a third one, we don't really believe the Bible, what the Bible says about eternity. I mean, maybe we, we either think Jesus is just kidding about hell, and kind of like me with our son sometimes, we, we threaten judgment to get him to do something, but we really don't follow through. Because let's, let's face it, it's more metaphorical because that, that just seems so harsh. When you read passages like Revelation 20, ooh, in which there's a great right throne judgment and all this place, the lake of fire, has, is there and it's reserved for Satan and his demons and the beast and the Antichrist. And then it says, and all those whose names aren't written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Whew. Nine in ten people in the Canelo Valley are currently off that list of the Lamb's Book of Life. Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats, right? Jesus says, and the goats were cast into hell, or the place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Luke tells a story in Luke, Jesus tells a story of a guy, a rich man who's in hell, and he just pleads, send Lazarus over here to dip his finger into some water and put it on my tongue so maybe I'll have a moment of relief from the anguish I'm in. I mean, those are some pretty graphic, and that's just three of the texts of the many in the scripture. Maybe we don't think God will really follow through. Maybe we think he's just kidding. Maybe we stop to think we don't think about those things anymore. Because it is, it, I mean, let's be honest. It's, it's, it's not fun to think about. I don't know. Or maybe our spiritual gift tests are the problem. I don't know about you. I've taken plenty of those, and I see what my gifts are. Oh, I'm a teacher, I'm a pastor, I'm a leader. I didn't see evangelists on there. That wasn't on my top 10, even my top three. And to be honest, I just don't like evangelism. All right, and we kind of get stuck. Well, that's just not me. That's, that's them. That's, that's what they do. They, they share with people, and they're good at it. I just don't like it. It's just not me. It's my, my gifting is service. That's all I do. And I like it. My gifting is computer programming. And I'm good at it. Hey, this isn't about, this isn't about personality. It's about a call, the card of God calling all his people in any realm that you're intentional and caring about seeing other people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus and growing in that knowledge and joy and love of him. It's having a vision for their life, not just for your own comfort. See, in the week, I was thinking to myself as I was preparing this, I, we just need to get off this excuse that it's just not what I like to do. I don't know of many evangelists who say to themselves, I just, I love the uncertainty of the experience. Before I go, I, who say, I just get more excited than, than a little bit fearful about what I'm going to go into. I don't think Paul loved to go into a city not knowing if he'd be beaten or received. I don't think he relished the thought going, this is going to be great. I might get beaten. Who knows? I might get thrown in prison. I don't know. I might get stoned. I don't know. But I might get received. Here we go. I think he was a little bit nervous and a little bit fearful every time. I don't think he relished going to Jerusalem on the final day in Acts chapter 20 verse 22. He said, and now behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit. I've got to go. Not that, man, I can't wait to get there. It'll be so much fun. We'll have a good time. Just we'll share, have a crusade, and people come forward, and I'll go home that night and count all the numbers who came forward and the city will be perfect. 
No, I'm compelled. I'm constrained to go by the Spirit. And here's the problem. I don't know what will happen to me there. I have no idea. Except that the Holy Spirit tells me in every city that imprisonment and affliction await me. Why is he going then? Because he's constrained by the Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he goes, the love of Christ, it controls me. Constrains me. It's not because he loves the possibility of getting beaten or rejected. Nobody loves that, right? I mean, raise your hand if you like the fact that somebody might look differently at you other than just sure delight and joy about who you are. Someone says, ah, that person is that kind of person. Nobody does. Paul doesn't do it because he loves it. He does it because he loves Christ and the people. And he's constrained by that love to do it. So we have to get away saying, I just don't like doing it. That's just not me. People, let me hear you on this. This isn't saying you all have to become like somebody, like a Paul, and be on missions everywhere. There's, there's places, but it does say in the focal point of my mind, in the focal point of my, wherever I go, I want Jesus to be known by my life in the most effective way that they might catch on to that, that they might understand what it is, not just see it, but understand it, and given the opportunity to respond by it. That's why I go to my office. Do you ever think that maybe God made you a certain way to put you in a certain environment so that that environment would be evangelized? It wasn't, first and foremost, that you can provide for your family, I would say. God provides for families. Some of you who have lost jobs know that all too well, that God provides even without that job. You are faithful in your environment. You care not about, ah, I love telling people... Let's just face it, I, I don't really enjoy telling people about Jesus because I'm, I have all the thoughts about the possibilities in my mind. But if that's my only motivation for doing it, then I'm not going to do it. Paul says, I'm constrained. I'm compelled by the love of Christ and my love for those people to do this. So, this is why I think Paul prays for boldness in Ephesians 6. This is why going to Timothy, he prays for boldness for Timothy because Timothy, a new pastor in an area, says do the work of evangelists. And Timothy is saying in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Timothy is afraid. And Paul says, hey, Timothy, we didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of boldness and of sound mind. This is why the apostles, after they experienced one day of preaching and the persecution that comes from it, they, they prayed for boldness to continue proclaiming the gospel. Prayed for boldness, prayed for courage, because in every which way, no matter who you are, whether you're Paul or you're just a housewife or just a metal worker or you name it, you are going to need courage because your flesh is not going to want to do it. So, let's do heart check number two. Paul says that it's his heart's desire. He'll do whatever he can for it to happen. Number two, am I willing to do anything at any time for anyone? Now, that's a broad. I mean, anyone, that's a lot of people, Tim. I can't do all those people. Right? I know, you can't do all those people. But you can do your neighbor. You can do the person at your work, the people you already interact with. Some of you in here, though, your whole world. Now, there are seasons of life. My grandparents are 90 years old, and they can't get out of the house. This is, this is not for them to go out and start knocking on doors. They can't even walk. So at that point, they say, Lord, I can pray. Right? How does this passion play itself out in my circumstance? But am I willing to do anything that I can do? physically do for anyone that at any time. Let me ask you this. Would you be willing for the, for the possibility, they just call it a 10% possibility, for you, for your neighbor to come to know Jesus. You have 10% possibility that they will. Would you become a vegetarian? Give up on all meat because there's a 10% chance that they might receive Christ. Forever. This isn't some season. This is forever because after they come to Christ, you've got to disciple them and it might take years for them to even come to Christ. And man, this is a long time to change your diet, right? Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 
If food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat unless I make him stumble. What if that neighbor is a vegetarian and is grotesque by meat? Would you become a vegetarian for that? I mean, let, me, let me be honest. I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know. Right? But Lord, it's because I love my meat and my experience with it than people knowing Jesus, and even for that 10%, because that's the problem, right? You don't really know if they're going to respond, if your, if your sacrifice will show up in fruit. You, don't, you have no idea. Are you willing to do anything at any time for anyone that they might know and see and love Jesus? Paul said in a few verses later in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, for though I am free from all people's opinions about me and, and constraints they put on my you should do this or that, I'm free of all that. I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel. Not, not, not because I love it, but because the gospel compels me, to, the love of God compels me to do it, and they need Jesus, and they won't know about him unless I bring the gospel that I may share with them in its blessing. So, again, this is for your heart just to do a little check on it. And Hesper, am I willing, Lord, to do anything at any time for anyone. Now, in this series, we're going to unpack that. I'm going to spend two weeks unpacking that, so that's all I'm going to say on it, but I at least want to bring it up because this, this, this extends the heart of Paul. This communicates the heart of Paul, and I think we need to have a little heart check on that ourselves. Let me just ask a couple other questions. Would you park on the other side of the sports academy for the possibility Ah, uh, when I come to church, you know, and I come in, gosh, I nice parking. So I don't want to walk too far. Would some of you be willing to park over there for the possibility of somebody? Maybe they'll show up, maybe they won't. I don't know. But what if they did that day? Would you do it every day of the year that they because someone came one time and took your parking space? Would you do it every day of the year. That's a lot of days, Tim. It is a lot of days to walk across the parking lot, because we have some parking across the way, right? We want more people to park there, so we have open spots here, create a limited parking here, so when people come to our campus, they're able to find a spot without being, man, chaotic, and if they're not a Christian, I don't want the flesh to get in the way of anything. Would you be willing to jump on the other side of this wall to be there, so when people show up, you can be ready for the kids? Would you be ready to go to your next door neighbor, and just say, you know what, talk to your wife, talk to your husband, hey, how can we start making some inroads with them, maybe some cookies one day? but at least we'll start praying for them. What can we do? Are you willing to do everything? Are you willing to have a conversation about it? On your, in your notes, you have a, um, a little sheet there. It's called My One Name. I want you to pull that out. Because before we get to the third point, or third heart check, I want you to think about Again, some of us in here have the capacity to think about hundreds of names, right, and go after them. But some of you are struggling with just one name at times. And so, what is that one name? Just one name, a person that, you know what, I'm going to just make sure. I might forget a lot of things. I'm not going to forget to pray for them. I'm not going to, I'm going to start thinking intentionally about that person. Coworker, neighbor. Don't put it somebody outside of your normal because you'll never get there. Put it somebody already in the sphere of where you're at. Maybe you don't know their name yet, but it's just next door neighbor. I'm going to learn their name, step one. And I'm going to start moving toward them. What's that one name? Over the course of these next five weeks with the series, starting today, we're going to be just talking and kind of pointing you to that one person, kind of applying all the things to that one person and having you think about that. You need to write that name down, by the way. If you haven't, you need to do that. This is an order, instruction. I can't move on until you do. Put on both cards. Both of those cards, we're going to rip it off and we're going to do something with one of those. But you need to have a clear name in mind to even know what person you're praying for, who you might be intentional toward. If you're not writing, you're writing. Don't think it's a suggestion. This is, not, this is a command. I'm done until you keep writing. See you, Bob. You're looking good. See, this is, this is part of us caring, just taking the time to think about who am I going to be intentional to care for. 
You might be that person who, man, you just, man, one's not enough. We'll write more than one down. But make sure when you write them down that, yeah, that, I have the capacity and, and, and space to pursue that, right? Don't put down 50 names if you're not that personality type. But at least have one. And here's what Paul did with his names, with his faces. He prayed for their salvation. Prayer is the place we start, it's the place that we carry through this progress with, and it's the place that we always end because we recognize chapter 9 does exist in which God is a sovereign mover, and Lord, we got to petition you for you to change and mold and shape their hearts, and that's where it starts. And Lord, shape and mold and change my heart because your spirit has to move there, and I'm going to start by praying for you to move and engage them in ways I don't even see, and let me not doubt that you're actually listening to my prayer and responding to it, because you are the God who paid for my prayer to happen, and you care about what I'm praying for. In the same way, Jesus' prayer that he taught his disciples to pray started with, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. He starts not with, give us today our daily bread, but your kingdom come, your will be done. You know what that is? That's expansion language. We want more of your kingdom on this earth. We want more people saved. We want to be spread. So yes, you can pray for those ancillary things that the Lord needs in your life. I need bread, I need work, I need all this, right? But let's not forget the main thrust of his heart and why we're here. Number three, heart check. Let's write this down. Do my prayers reflect God's desire for more? Let's reflect his desire for more. That's our action point for this week. I want you to take that name. I want you to pray for more for that person. Pray for them to come to faith. Just start praying for that. I'm going to call the band forward. I'm going to call a few of the couple elders forward to take down this big wall right here. Because here's what we're going to do. During the worship time, I want to ask that you take that other card. Keep one in your in your Bible, put it on your car dashboard, put it on your mirror at home, put it somewhere you'll see it every day to remember to pray for them in that moment. And then the other one, we're gonna have you pin, we have some clothespins over here, to this wall. You're gonna hang it up there. These are the people that our church is praying for. These are the people our church is pursuing. This is the people that found people are going to find. If you say that you're a found person by the blood of Christ and the mission of God, then guess what? Your call is to go find people. And this name represents the person that God has put in my heart to be finding, going after. This will be up here every week. We're gonna see those names, praying for them. And you guys are going to be going after them and caring for them. And I, the five weeks is not the goal. It's the catalyst for the process over the next half year to full year, whatever it may be. But we want to see names come to know Jesus in this next year and beyond. Let me close in prayer. The band will lead us, and you make your way up here and put your name on the board. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for how you love us and you sent your son to die for us. We thank you that you have written our name in your book. We thank you that... You have given us the seal of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that we have been commissioned to go and make disciples, to follow you and make fishers of men. Lord, that we would go after people and fulfill that. Father, and all along the way, I pray that my brothers and sisters here and myself would hear the deep, resounding, confident statement by you that I love you, lo, I am with you always even to the end of this age. Amen. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of a Savior. 